Happy Friday, everyone. Let's get the energy up in here. Last thing to do for the day before we wrap up on an amazing weekend. This is designing dashboards. Rohan says grossly underestimated how much time this would take. It can take a long time, but you know what? My guess is the first time takes the longest slash the super badge. If any of you have done the reporting super badge, that one took a really long time. Hopefully this one was a little bit better, but I'm so happy to see some amazing faces, familiar faces, and it's a Friday, so nothing to complain about. Let's dive in and um, Ryan, introduce yourself and tell me something that I don't know about you. All right. Um, hey everyone, my name is Brian Owens. I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama. I live in Atlanta now. Um, I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem for about three and a half years. A uh, total of 15 certifications, reporting uh, is really kind of my bread and butter is how I really got comfortable and confident uh, in the Salesforce space and really kind of made a name for myself there. Um, fun fact that Rachel does not know about me. Ooh, I feel like we talk so often now. Um, let's see. <gasps> I have a older brother who is 16 years older than me. 16 years older. Okay, mm -hmm. that's awesome. I have <laughs> an aunt. I have an aunt that's 16 years older. That's cool. That's a that that that's a very fun fact. Not one that mm -hmm. I would have expected. So wonderful. Thank you, Brian, for sharing that. And with that, everyone, let's dive in. Y'all know how this works. We learn from each other. All of the most amazing learning is going to happen today from seeing each other's dashboards or prototypes, balsamic, whatever that y'all put together. It's a discussion, it's feedback, it's Q and A. It's all driven by you. And the cool thing about it is that if you wanna share, you can do that here in a safe space. There's no grades, there's no scores, there's no judging. And there's no doing it wrong, even though sometimes when we create things, it doesn't quite miss the mark. That doesn't mean that you did it wrong. It means that you did it right because the way that we learn how to do it right is by doing it wrong and then learning from it. And of course, have fun. Um, theatrical flair, fun facts, gifts, fun branding, all of these things contribute to a fun experience, which of course increases the safety and Science has shown that if you're having fun, it actually increases your learning. So it all comes full circle. Here's what we're going to do today. Interview or introduce the goals, the prompt. Y'all will probably be familiar with this scenario since many of you are returning from Wednesday's skills challenge. We'll do a brief topic discussion because that's when we get to engage with all of you in the beginning, introduce the topic. And if y'all have any specific questions, before we dive in for the live feedback, that will be your time. And then of course we wrap up. How do I interact in this session? Well, first and foremost is to raise your hand, get live feedback or work through the challenge if you are stuck. That's the first way. And other ways are to interact in the chat. I see Emily, I see Rohan, I see Dawn and Swati and Karen have found the chat button. That's the first way. You can also ask a question live. If you wanna raise your hand and go through part of the task, you can do that as well. Or if you wanna ask your question in the Q&A box, you can do that. So with that, let's introduce the scenario and the task. You've been hired as a business analyst to join a team working for Stanford D School. Up until this point, Stanford has used forms and Google Sheets to manage course enrollment. They hired your team to adjust their system to begin using Salesforce to manage course enrollment. Stanford also is interested in increasing analytics and reporting abilities. That's where you come in. And they desire a powerful and robust dashboard, which can be used for decision making between teams. You will be working closely with Peter Wu slash you will be reading Peter Wu's interview notes to guide you through it. I've just linked in those interview notes for you all to read through. 
here's the task. Start by reviewing the resources provided to, protect, to gather potential data sources. This might be, mm, what are the pain points? What are the KPIs? What are the metrics? What are the things that would make the most sense to go on the dashboard? Once you've gathered your data sources, consider what they mean. Brainstorm how to integrate them into your CRM. And of course, using your data, design a dashboard prototype. Be sure to consider the user experience during your design process. I also saw some questions, really great, great questions in the Slack channel regarding, is this a prototype? Is this a mock-up? Is this a wireframe? We'll get into that in a little bit of the differences between those things. And I'll give you a quick answer. You can present all of those things. They are all key skills and key steps in going to create the actual dashboard. But we'll get into those differences in a little bit. Your dashboard should clearly present key trends and be easy for non-technical users to understand. If you're a course enrollment representative, can I use this dashboard? Is it going to be useful to me? And then, of course, during the live sessions, you will present your dashboard prototype. <laughs> Karen says, prototype, mock-up, wireframe. Oh my, fabulous. I enjoy that. You will know you are done when you have integrated your insights from Peter's interview to craft a dashboard within Salesforce. You've gathered potential data sources, considered their relevance to the client, and built a prototype, a visual appealing prototype that will re represent key data in an intuitive way. Okay, so if you are new to AirMeet, now is your time. Find that raise hand button and get in the queue. How do we join the Slack channel? Please paste the link to the chat. Astrid, if you go to the calendar invitation, there should be a link at the bottom that will bring you to the Slack channel. If not, I will post the link um, shortly for you. But in the meantime, we are going to begin our feedback uh, part. So I see some hands being raised in the queue. Two hands came up. First, let's do a little coach discussion on the topic. So starting with the difference between prototype, mock-up, wireframe, visualization. Goodness gracious, what do all of these words mean, Brian? Tell us. All right. Um, so in the world of, I guess, kind of product management and UX, UI, um, I guess kind of the two buckets that we like to put these in are what we call low fidelity and high fidelity. Um, kind of demos or mock-ups. The simplest way for me to explain it is a low fidelity um, mock-up prototype wireframe is going to be something that's kind of two-dimensional. It can be as simple as a sketch on a sheet of paper. You know, I've done sketches in Miro. I've done Visio boards um, to kind of show what a dashboard would look like. Um, but the point is, it doesn't really move. It doesn't do anything. It's just kind of a steel picture that you look at. More high fidelity would be um, actually building a mock-up of a dashboard within Salesforce, showing someone how the filters works um, and kind of interacting with it, showing that if you update a record in Salesforce and you go back to the dashboard and refresh it, that that information will be there. And that's more of a kind of high fidelity portion. Awesome. So one is um, not stagnant. What's the word? Static. One is static. Yes. One moves a little bit, a little bit more interactive. Maybe it doesn't have like everything built out as, as a prototype. What's the difference between a mock-up and the real deal, if you will? A mock-up would be, so in given our scenario, a mock-up would be you know, maybe you don't have all the classes in there. You have very, you know, small amounts of data. Stanford D school would have thousands of students enrolled in a semester. A mock-up, only thing you really need is enough to show the variations in your chart. When you're doing a prototype, you want to, you want your numbers to represent a little bit more closely of what the client would be looking for. Um, and the reason for that, for kind of a higher end prototype, staying with our school example, um, let's say that I'm presenting this to Emily and she wants to kind of dive into the data more and say, hey, well, could I see my students based upon 
their classifications. If I only have five students in my mock-up, I'm not really going to be able to show that as well. Whereas if I'm doing a prototype and I have a thousand students in my kind of demo, I can easily show like, okay, yeah, we can, you know, divide and show different slices of the data with a larger data set. Gotcha. So dummy data is sufficient, but if we want to build that out, so it's, it's kind of like validation, right? You don't want to build out the whole thing until you have what you've built validated and then move into the next stage. Yep. And typically from a consulting perspective, you're going to use dummy data either way. Um, it's just kind of the volume of the data. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And uh, someone had posted earlier in the Slack channel a little bit of dummy data, which was super fun. Vandana. Yeah, I saw that you had posted some um, some dummy data in there, which was really great. So if you didn't do that, no worries. We would love to see what you um, have brought to the stage. So let's go into uh, Rohan. Looks like Rohan has a presentation ready to go. So. Welcome to the stage, Rohan. Hello. So Hi. I had uh, plenty of experience with CRMA reports and dashboards, so I decided to uh, try my hand at wireframing. All right. So if I can figure out what I did with that file. I have too many windows and tabs open thank you for not sharing your story screen. Of my life. <laughs> oh i always uh branch out a new window for presenting yeah good okay so i learned figma today and that's where i spent most of my time so i have my so this is the university dashboard some of the kpi indicators that they wanted was to have their projected revenue and where they are at uh, they wanted to know about uh students enrolled so currently have it segmented by terms i don't know how many terms they have i'm going to assume four so we have our projected column and our actual obviously this is fictitious data because i don't think you're going to have projected so low and actual very high we have our enrollment versus dropout, and I want to have different filters. So we have the full university. We could this would be a clickable button that could you could select what type of college or department you want to focus on, and then after this filter, we'll have the list of courses that you can drill down down on. And one of the other components they wanted to worry about was the common dropout reasons. So based on the CSAT information, they could get populated with what are the most common dropout reasons. All right. Uh, um, this, this is what I good. got in about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Everyone, yeah, thank you, Rohan, for being here. <laughs> I, I have been CSAT. watching tutorials since 7 AM. And this is, the, this is what I could get. Yeah. Uh, this this completes the job. It completes the task. Um, from this, I can kind of get an idea of what my dashboard would look like. Um, also, another thing, I guess, since Rohan started with Figma, depending on your customers, they may or may not know what a Salesforce dashboard or a CRMA dashboard looks like. Um, so it's one thing to kind of keep that in mind, but don't don't give yourself kind of like analysis paralysis because if it's wrong they won't know nine times yeah. out of ten um i'm pretty but sure I do you like can the, do the drill down like filter this yeah. out by the departments and then based off of this the dependent pick list value of will be reflected into it yeah um you can definitely do it in crma i unless i'm unless i'm really confident about the back end metadata on a Salesforce report, I tend to kind of stay away from the filters because, you know, like that college department that may be a field on one object, but it's not across all the other objects and it just gets funky. Um, but I know, you, I know you mentioned that you had experience with CRMA. 
Uh, so if you did it there, it would be totally fine. I really I like you. your enrollment dropout chart. Um, that yes. would not have picked the. That would not have been a view I would have thought about, but it actually works out really good from a storytelling perspective. Um, so a great job for kind of pulling in that under chart. Um, it took many yeah, attempts so yeah. to try to figure out how to of getting an option, which one of them was always lower than the other one, because you're never going to have enrollment be less than the dropout rate. Yeah. So, yeah, it works out really good from a storytelling perspective. Um, like if I'm thinking about what charts I would probably turn them into, I would probably look at like a waterfall chart for your enrollment dropout. Um, I think that tells a good story and you could put those reasons yeah. and tie that all into one chart. Um, but this was a really good start and it gives it, it would give me as a stakeholder um, confidence to know that we would end up with a dashboard that's actionable, that I can get a queer picture of what's going on with my students. Yep. So, and regarding your point here. about uh, some things not being available on all objects, I know that you can do different pages. So like this could be the university review and this is the university dashboard. Clicking this button could switch to a different view that had mm -hmm. things like either projected revenue for the college or department level and you definitely don't need it for the course level. Yeah, but yeah, you absolutely can have the right. Different... And you can definitely play around with those pages and do a lot of great things there. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you, Rohan. There's so much love coming to you from the chat. Amazing job on this wireframe, and thank you for presenting. Brian, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the data types that were there. We saw the donut chart, we saw the bar graph, we saw a couple other, and then you also mentioned waterfall mm -hmm. charts. Can you kind of talk to what those different type, different components are and when would we use them? Yep. Um, so when I'm doing a Salesforce dashboard, which is the ones I probably do more often now, um, I typically like to use donut charts um, because they give me a way to categorize my data and also show the sum. So for example, if we are dealing with student data again, maybe I wanna look at course enrollment by, um, and I guess divided by the gender of the students or maybe by their majors. We could have different slices of the donut represent different majors. Um, and then have the total number of students enrolled in the course kind of in the center of the donut. So that's what I like to use those for. Um, if it's something that I'm pacing towards a goal, uh, let's say we have a goal of a certain amount of revenue or we want to keep our dropout rate um, above a certain percentage. I like to use gauge charts for those and you can kind of color code and do a red, yellow and green. So you can kind of know like, hey, are we in a good spot? Do you know we need to put some more attention towards this KPI to make sure we don't fall in the red area? Um, another chart that I really like to use is the stack bar charts or stack horizontal charts. Kind of going back to that cate categorization, um, you can see the total of your data and also break things into smaller categories. Oh, and a waterfall chart, because uh, you asked about that. So waterfall charts are primarily used in CRMA. Um, they are a little confusing until you understand them. Let me see if I can find a picture of one. Um, after the next person, I'll kind of look for a waterfall chart, and we'll circle back to that one. Awesome. Yes, yep. well, we, we can circle back to that one with an example. You said CRMA. What customer? What does that stand uh, so for? CRMA is CRM analytics. Analytics. Gotcha. Or, gotcha. Or um, Tableau. Essentially, it's Tableau that lives within the Salesforce platform now. Um, so Tableau used to be and technically still is a standalone product that Salesforce acquired uh, probably two years ago. There have been a bunch of iterations and name changes for what the product is going to be called inside of Salesforce. 
um, and CRMA, I guess is the newest name. So um, when you see kind of demos from Salesforce and they talk about Einstein discovery and things like that, that all lives within the CRMA program. Similar feature, different name, classic Salesforce move. Is that? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. And Rohan says Einstein Analytics became Tableau, which then became CRM Analytics and will eventually be called AI stuff. And maybe someday yeah. it, will become, <laughs> it will become the Owens method. If I had a say, that's what I would call it. <laughs> Okay, everyone, welcome Vandana to the stage. I see a dashboard. Love it. Vandana, the stage is yours. Thanks, Rachel. How are you doing? Hi, Brian. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. So when I saw the challenge, right, initially I was in a confusion whether I'm supposed to do the prototype or whether it is supposed to be a Salesforce dashboard, but there was a data factor. So I made the dashboard. OK, so uh, based on the data, what I had, I had used the data for the data import challenge. So same data I used and made the dashboard. So in this dashboard, what I have captured is enrollment based on the majors. That means like, you know, how many students are there on each uh, majors you know so there were many varieties so i have captured that and also the enrollment status with the course id which will indicates like and if you go here so there are around 41 percent who are enrolled and there is around 27 percent it is under wait list so this will give a clear indication based on the status what is the enrollment status and uh, this will talk about like, you know, how many people are exploring because there were incomplete data. So I had made an assumption saying that they're exploring because they have not chosen any kind of a major. So there were some people who are still exploring, maybe uh, like, you know, counselor may have to talk to them and say that, like, you know, is there they would need any kind of information from the school before choosing the major so that's the reason i put them as exploring this was the data and uh, and another data like you know was incomplete you know many students enrolled but they did not put entire information what was needed so that also i had captured so this is the dashboard i created would be happy to get the feedback Yep. Um, so this looks really good, Vandana. Um, you have the donut chart in there that I just talked about. Um, uh -huh. So I really like to use those, the gauge chart there. Um, like I said, I would use this one. <clears throat> Let's just say they had a goal of, it looks like you have yours a little bit above 30 students. Yeah, so, 40 students you know, were there. Yeah. Um, so like if if 40 students were still in this exploring stage or undecided in terms of their major, you know, that may be something that you want to call out. Um, so that's a great way to kind of use a gauge chart there. Um, I really like your breakdown of the majors. Um, another way you could show this data is kind of use, using one of those stack charts like I was talking about earlier. Okay. Um, it would just kind of like save you a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. um, and especially like if you were looking at this over multiple semesters or multiple school years, you could stack that data and basically just have one chart um, okay. for each school year. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. In fact, I just did this one in last 30 minutes, you know, with the confusion whether I have to do a prototype or the real data. I just made some report what I thought, you know, could be like, you know, as an enrollment, like, you know, person, what would I want to see on my dashboard? No problem. Um, like I said, it, it works out well. It gets the job done. Um, the only thing that I might caution against is just, I'm just not a fan of tables and dashboards. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to kind of like to show more charts, such as your enrollment status with incompletes. 
um, maybe just show those in a chart view. Because mm -hmm. if you click into, and the reason I don't do that, if you click into one of your reports that has the chart, Uh, yeah, Vandana, if you, you want to go to the, to one of the reports. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Can you see now? I think you probably showed the tab with us. Uh, no. Is this a screenshot of your dashboard or is this within the dev org? It is within the dev org. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. You should be able to click on the link. Um, that says view report. Where do I? Can I go back and see the report? Yeah, well, if you just, uh, for from the dashboard, I guess just for the good of the group, uh, there's a link up under every chart that says view the dashboard. Oh, I mean, okay, here, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the reason I tend not to show tables in there is uh -huh. like when you click into the report, essentially you could have your table here. Oh, okay, this one, right? Yep. So instead of having instead of having this view essentially on your dashboard, you could just have a chart, and then if people wanted to see it as a table, they can just click into the table. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What I, in fact I was trying to do was like you know I like you know is there any kind of a notes or anything? Can we add this to a dashboard? For example, like, you know, I always wonder, like, charts are there, and if you want to go back and refer, or do you want to put, is there a text format can we add in the dashboard? Um, I think there is a way to add kind of like a text thing now. If you can go back to your dashboard. Yeah. Now there's a way you can add, hit edit for me. Okay. Uh, hit add new component or add component there. Okay. Okay, maybe it won't let you do it. Maybe I will look around that, you know. Yeah. So I know you can do um, in the CRM analytics product that Rohan and I were chatting about, you can add kind of like text boxes and rich text, text fields. Uh -huh. um, I feel like there was a way because I've done it before, like linking it to other dashboards. But I cannot remember how to do it right now. OK, that's OK. Maybe I like, you know, in fact, I was looking for that information so that, you know, uh, any assumptions made, I can just put it there saying that even for like, you know, real time also, this is what is there. So I wasn't able to get that in time. So that's a reason. Like, that's a good. Yeah, I can try to implement that. Thank you for the feedback. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Vandana. All right. If we've got other presenters that want to share their work and work through the challenge, definitely go ahead and raise your hand. We talk about, yes, you can. Not sure at which part that was at a couple minutes ago. I think, Brian, you said, I'm not sure if we can do this here. Anyone else? Refresh my memory, Michael. I can't remember. But yes, agreed. Excellent prototype, Vandana. Thank you so much for coming up on the stage. Um, Brian, do you want to chat about waterfall charts for a second? While you pull that up, I'm going to bring this poll up onto the stage, and then we can chat about it. So everyone, while, while uh, Brian thinks about <laughs> which waterfall chart to show, he finds that link, let's vote. What is your favorite dashboard visualization component i think donut chart's gonna win just just saying funnels are pretty cool too yeah funnels are pretty cool thanksgiving's coming up maybe that's influencing the vote no donuts winning by a long shot i feel bad for the bar graph how come nobody likes bar graphs okay Donut chart is, sounds like that one's going to win. So huzzah, everyone, donut charts win. Would love to hear from all of you in the chat why you found, oh yeah, I forgot about the the, the gauge, the gauge. It's also a good one. Um, 
Yeah, we'd love to hear from every everyone why you chose that to be your favorite. Personally, I like the donut charts because it has not only the the breakup and the kind of the percentage vis visualization, but there, there can be numbers in the middle. So both of those, you know, covers both areas. Rowan says, I personally love area charts. Not sure what that is. What's an area chart? Are you talking about like a heat chart, Rohan? A heat chart. Like for sales, we're getting close to our goal. Um, um, yeah, like sometimes people use it. Let's take one. Oh, okay. He was saying the, the one he did for his enrollment and dropout is an area chart. Oh, it kind of looks like the mountains. So it shows mm. both, both categories. Mm, mm -hmm. Kind of like a scatter chart, it sounds like, but less about the lines and more like building, if that makes sense. Five charts, yep. favorite component. Mm -hmm. Karen says it depends. Was I able to find the one that I was looking for? Rohan, I need your Googling skills. Send us something about <laughs> waterfall charts. <laughs> I say this will have to work. I was trying to find one in a dev org, but I'm locked out of the dev org where I had it. So this will have to work. Of course. Okay. All right. So the top chart here is a waterfall chart. Let me try to zoom in a little bit more. Okay, um, so a lot of times we've used it in um, kind of like sales. We want to look at, we may have a sales revenue that came in for the previous quarter, let's say of $10 million. We want to be able to look at that and kind of isolate different variables. So we want to see, hey, are we selling of our $10 million dollars? If it's, if it's sold on the West Coast, how does that influence it? So this kind of goes back to the filters and things that we were using uh, that Rohan was talking about. You can play around with different filters and say, hey, if you're on the West Coast, does that influence how well we sell or does that negatively affect how well we sell? And that would be these green and red kind of fluctuations here. Um, so this is just kind of looking at a full pipeline and saying, hey, um, starting with the pipeline, this is 120. And then we have an increase, an increase, and then in this category is taking it out. So it just shows how different variables affect a full pipeline or I guess whatever data you're trying to track. That's that's pretty comprehensive. So if we were to translate this into course enrollment, like what might you, what might be a use case for this scenario? Um, I would probably use this for the enrollment versus dropout. So going back to what Rohan was doing with, um, and he just asked the question. So what he was doing with the area chart. So the way I would look at this and say, um, Let's say that the total the total enrollment for last school year was a thousand students, just to keep numbers simple. Um, and then I want to look at okay for my students who have dropped out, we can say if they were a freshman, the dropout rate was a lot higher. If their course load was more than the recommended credits. So it would negatively affect their chances of dropping out if they took too many credits. Um, it would positively, so in a green chart, it would positively affect them staying in school if they didn't have a major. So I guess the way that you would tell the story would be, hey, we have a thousand students. If they don't come in with the major, there's a good chance that they won't drop out because they're not kind of dead set on what they need to do. So if they struggle through that first class or that first semester, they aren't distraught. Um, so you would just kind of look at how different things. So if they had a major, um, how many courses they were taking, um, and then you could kind of get into, 
you know, demographics, which can become kind of ethical. Um, and, in, and in CRM analytics, you have a way to kind of hide those variables. So like if you wanted to hide race, um, because you don't want that to negatively influence how the algorithm kind of looks at things, you have a way to do that. Cool. Yeah, filters filters are important. Um, let's see, Rohan has a good question. Can you build a waterfall going from left to right? This one has, it's full on the right and less on the left. Rohan. Yes, you can. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm going to keep looking as we're going through these and see if I can figure out how to get back in that dev org. Happens at the greatest times. Um, <laughs> sorry, Brian, to make you multitask. Uh, is CRM analytics generally available in all Salesforce editions or is it extra? It is extra for customers to have it. They do have a CRM dev org that you can do um which is what i'm trying to get into and you can also um go through salesforce modules to um salesforce modules to get a crm dev org awesome cool well that sounds like some great homework everyone go research that on trailhead and and see what we have yeah that way we can start with full attendance it can go week to week of those dropping out week to week yeah that would be a really interesting metric as well if we want to look at um at what point in the semester are people more likely to drop out if they make it past a certain point does that mean they're basically set in stone comparing with deadlines and whatnot let's see if you did the trailheads in this module, they gave you a link to get the CRM dev org. Thank you, Pat. Thanks for doing the supplemental resources. That's what they're there for. <gasps> Free CRM analytics dev org here. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Emily, for sharing that. I remember asking Peter when dropouts commonly occur. Oh yeah, that's right, Rohan. You, I think you were in that skills challenge. I'm gonna pull up our slides um, while we pull that up and see if we can get you into that dev board. But let's do a little bit of a refresh just on the task because the way that this is really structured here, everyone, is to go through a step-by-step -step process. So if you did attend the last session, it means we talked about KPIs, right? We talked about KPIs. Those are also listed in the interview notes. So Start by reviewing the resources provided to gather potential data sources. Would love to hear from all of you which ones you thought were the most interesting or the most important. When you look at those interview notes, which I'll, I'll link over here. Oh, that's the wrong link. Remove. So when y'all take a first glance at these interview notes, what stands out to you as the most important, the most important KPIs, for example? Metrics for course popularity, speed of class enrollment. Okay, cool. That sounds like an interesting one, right? So we go through the KPIs, we determine which ones are most important. And then Brian, what would you say? The next step, once we have those KPIs, it says consider what they mean and brainstorm how to integrate them into Salesforce. So does that mean we start thinking about what kinds of charts we use? Does it mean we start poking around and building reports? um that's when you really start to look at like what data do you have um and what i mean by that is so like we were talking about dropout reasons um i mentioned in the last session um because they were doing because they were doing google docs and spreadsheets and things like that it was probably in text fields so what type of for that to do it efficiently you probably need to set up a pick list value to make sure just everything is is clean um so that's that's kind of what you mean there is you want to look at the data you have and make sure you have all the necessary information um to be able to report on it because if you don't you know like let's say they're doing the dropout reasons and they're not really tracking it they just put that somebody drops out you're not going to be able to really back up what the reasons are 
if you know it's in some in somebody's email or something like that and you have to figure out if the level of effort to be able to report on that is worth it because it may take you more time to gather that information and depending on the scope and the budget and the project it may not make sense okay so you know in the real world we would want to go back and see if we can get that data from our stakeholders or like what if it's just not there if it's not there it's not there um and sometimes you have to tell people i i had to tell somebody that today um they wanted to report on market demographics we just don't have the data it's something that we can do moving forward um and you may have to come at it from a different perspective so let's let's do kind of like a market thing for students like if you want to say students from california you want to kind of track regionally where your students are coming from but you're not tracking that today what you could do is you could group them together by states and then kind of do some mapping to say california is west coast um and kind of build in some formulas that way so, I mean, you could make it work, but generally, if I don't have the data from a customer, I have to go back and ask myself the question and sometimes go back and ask them the question, is the metric really that important if you were not tracking it beforehand? It's fine mm -hmm. if you want to track it moving forward, but to spend a lot of time like looking for something that's really not there, um, may not be the best use of your time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. You would think that the most important metrics are the ones that they're already tracking. <laughs> Although yeah. there's definitely use cases where it's like, we need to start tracking this because we don't have the information. You can't go back and necessarily retroactively. Correct. That, and that's but... when you just say like, hey, we can do this moving forward. But, you know, right now we can't you know, we can't retroactively kind of make up data. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, would there be a way though? So, so if we're taking course enrollment data, right? Like mm -hmm. if we, Wendy says college students may be like, I don't have time for this and give everything a one or a five for the rating. So if we don't have a specific reason, is there a way that we could infer the reason? from other data sources or is it better? You could, you could definitely do those type of things. The only caution I kind of have with doing stuff like that is that you want to make sure you have good alignment from your, um, from your stakeholders that they understand that. Right. So like understand that, hey, this isn't a hundred percent accurate. This is, our best guess based upon the information that you have and generally what i do in those situations is that I, I create two different reports so i have a best case scenario um so going back to our dropout example this is our best case scenario or our best guess about why students were dropping out and then in the second report we'll start tracking the information and then we'll say hey students are dropping out because of this reason Okay, that makes sense. Or Wendy also suggested a dropout survey. So we could we could go back and see if we could get it. But what 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 might be some challenges or things to look out for with that solution? If I drop out of the school, I'm not filling out a survey. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What's in it? What's in it for the for the student to send it out? Right. Maybe some free mug, some some free swag. Okay. Awesome. So we've kind of considered what they mean, thinking about how we can integrate that in. And then it gets into the building part. And I think this might be a place that gets tricky for some of us. We know what we want to display. We know why it's important. We know how it can help the stakeholder. But in order to build those dashboard components, you got to have a report. So how do we go about doing that? Is there a framework, step-by-step -step methods that we can go from like end result back to actually building the, the thing, the report that we need? Um, 
generally when I build reports, um, it's a three-step process when I build reports. So the standard reports within Salesforce, any of the standard objects, there's already a report there. So kind of think about that like a template um, and what we're working on. All of these would most likely be custom objects unless you were doing student data, which would be contact. So let's, let's stick on the student data. So there would be a standard report for contact. So I would create that report um, and then I will look at the fields that are available. We already said that we're going to have to create some custom fields. So I'm going to pull all those custom fields into the system. Um, really just and really start kind of taking the KPIs that we worked on earlier this week and figuring out, hey, do I have the data points in this report to answer these questions or to to back up or justify the KPIs that we that we laid out? If the data is there, then your report is good. Um, I And when I do this on my three step approach, I don't even do the charts on the first one. I just basically just give them the data. Um, I may group it together by student. I may group it together by classification, by major. And that can be conversations that are kind of had with them. Um, so I'm trying to read this. Um, yeah, so that's what I do on the first visit. And then I generally give them a week, a couple days, just depending on how urgent it is. Um, and I let them use it kind of in their everyday life and then come back to me with feedback. So maybe um, maybe there's a data point that's not in the report that they really want to be able to see. So that's kind of that back and forth that Rachel and I were just talking about is um, hey, we we really want to track this. Um, can you see if we have something like that now? Um, yes, Pat, you can build custom reports. Um, typically, I, I do custom reports if I'm kind of combining other objects. Um, and like I said, in this scenario, you may have to do it because you're going to have a lot of custom objects. But just sticking with the, the student perspective, because that would primarily be built on the contact object. I wouldn't do a, a custom report right out the gate on this one. Um, but after I got the feedback from the customer, then I would go back and make whatever adjustments they requested. So if it's adding a new field, changing the way I'm doing groupings, and then I would go about building out the dashboards once I kind of have the okay from them that they understand what my report is trying to say. Um, and then a couple of days later or a week later, I presented them the final dashboard that has the completed reports. Okay, so step one, checking that the data points are available. Step two, going in, building the report. Step three, presentation and validation. Yep. Okay, right on. Well, we like three simple steps. Um, Vandana says the existing file didn't have a dropout reason. Maybe we can add that and use it for future challenges. Yeah, and Vandana, to be honest, like you totally went above and beyond. Everybody drop some emojis for Vandana because she put in um, the data from a totally separate skills challenge and used it here. But my guess is too, we could go back and create a custom field as well. If that's not an out of the box feature as an admin, that's probably a custom field that we would create and then import in or make up some dummy data just for the use case. If that's something like, would we do that in the real world? Just make up a bunch of data to illustrate. Yep. For the, for the purposes of um, this, absolutely. Like awesome. I would go and lock up some data and, um, just have it in there to, to show. Perfect. So follow up steps for y'all later on. The Karen says we need to have the same class again in a week or so to see if we've learned more. Karen, that's an excellent idea. We've actually already created a three part series on this exact topic coming up next month. Uh, I can post that in the Slack channel. And of course we do love to see a week two weeks down the line once y'all come back and uh revamp things another skills challenge series yes it 
it's going to be amazing. Okay, so going back to our three-step process, we go back, we create the report, we present it to our stakeholder. In real life, what comes next? Do they always like auto-approve it? Yes. I mean, no. <laughs> Ryan, I'm sure for you, they're like, I love it. It's amazing. But what what about the rest of us who are new to, new to it? No, um, 99%. If somebody tells me they love it after that first kind of view, I know they probably didn't use it and they probably didn't look at it. Um, because I, I try not to add too much to it. I try to give them a blank canvas as much as possible because I think that's kind of one of the skills within report building that people don't often kind of talk about. Like I have my personal preference on building charts and like we talked about the donuts, the gauges and the stat charts. But if I'm preparing, um, if I'm preparing my charts for the, the click team, they may not like the data like that. And I need to build it in a way that's usable for them. Um, so I try to just give them the blank data because they may want it grouped together by the number of skill challenges or the number of credits that a student is taking a semester. I may not want to do it that way. So I just want to give them the raw data and say like, hey, take a look at this, you know, give me your feedback and then we can talk about ways to group the data. And it's, it's really kind of a partnership and that's why I do it in that three step approach. So I can get feedback, kind of adjust it. Um, and then that last third second, third session is really kind of a working session where I show them how we can group the, get, group the data together and then start building out the charts. Yeah, totally makes sense. So there's, there's a theme here, whether you're doing business analysis or UX design specifically, ideate, verify, build lo-fi, verify, build out, verify, <laughs> make sure that they've listened slash looked at the dashboard. If you get an immediate yes, go back, do some, uh, do some hands-on training to make sure that, that they have seen it. Excellent. Uh, Vandana says, maybe I'll add a few more fields for the existing file and post in the Slack channel. Yeah, that'd be awesome. If you want to mock up some dummy data uh, regarding course enrollment, let us know. Verify and validation checks everywhere and let's see we oh sharon you're here you made it welcome back um i'm gonna jump into sharon's question in just one second in the meantime though everyone if you've loved this session if you have any learning or suggestions for us if you would take a quick 58 seconds or maybe even less to let us know that is what helps us to create these experiences requests from you things to change and additional suggestions so Super appreciate your feedback before we end up this session. And then Sharon's question. Oh, that's interesting. What's a typical sales cycle? How long does it take to link a deal? And what I will add on to that is how could we represent the sales cycle, et cetera, in a dashboard? Um, typical sales cycle depends on the company and kind of what they're selling. Um, and financial services, it would take maybe four to six weeks to close a deal. Um, and ad sales, it takes probably three to four months to close the sale. Um, so it really just kind of depends. And then, Rachel, you were saying, how do we link it? Yeah, uh, not not link it, sorry, but we know what the sales cycle is. We know that obviously for a sales representative, that's going to be very important data. Where is the person in the pipeline? Have they been sitting in a particular stage? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we display yeah. that in our chart? So what what the easiest way to do that is, um, I don't know, I call it a stale opportunity report. Basically, what you want to look at is um, there are three data points that you need to kind of do this. Um, one is the created date of an opportunity, the, and all of this is in a standard report called the opportunity history report. Um, so it's a, a start date or the created date, basically whenever the opportunity was created, 
you want to see if it has a close date. Um, and then you want to see how long it's been in the current stages. So let me try to figure out what those three fields are right quick. But essentially, you would look at those and say, hey, <clears throat> based upon our sales cycle, if something takes six weeks to close, but I have a opportunity that's been in the same stage for two months, that's either an opportunity that's not progressing through the pipeline anymore and the sales rep forgot to close it or just chose not to close it, which happens more often than we would like to admit. Um, or it could be the sales rep needs help or it's just a very complicated sale. Cool. All right. Hopefully that answers your question, Sharon. I think it was pretty comprehensive. Um, I am going to take a risk and share a screen with something that Adrian had posted in the Slack channel. Hopefully that's okay, Adrian. Um, cause this is an example of, um, kind of my favorite style of dashboard slash wireframe. There we go. Okay. So Adrian yeah. says, these are my data part scribbles that would go into a dashboard. I want to learn different charts. I think this is a great way to summarize what we've learned in the session. What are each of these components? What are they here for? Yeah. Let's do that question since we've got two minutes left. <laughs> decoding yeah i was getting something from sharon um on different charts everyone would love to see which or hear from you which ones you see i will start so put put in the chat which components you see brian i'm sure you'll beat us to it but i see yeah. i think is a pie definitely chart. see a line chart at the top left um I would assume this is a table over to the top right. It has name and then number of something. Um, I see pie charts down here in the bottom. Um, yeah, those are different components. I see. Yeah, it looks like there could be time completed course. That could maybe be what you were referring to before is like the start date, maybe the class start date, the class end date. Where are they? Sorts of things. Okay. Well, that was fun. Thanks. Thanks for that little challenge, Adrian, <laughs> of uh, helping us to decode those components. And thanks, Brian, for sharing the stale opportunity. I'm going to go back to share my screen. That's a wrap, everyone. Thank you. Hello, oh, there's music in there. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Going back. My theatrical flow was interrupted, but we will get it back. Emily, thank you for being here. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everyone who has participated. Please stay tuned in the Slack channel for the replay, as well as the link to how you can learn more dashboard magic. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and we will see you next time.